So I'm going to talk about mixed reality because this is my favorite technology that we're playing with right now. Uh, Nick earlier talked about a, a number of things that I was going to talk about, so I'll skim over those and try to focus on other aspects. But what is mixed reality? I think by now, uh, as long as you guys were here earlier, then you've got a good sense of what that is. Uh, we talked about this uh, continuum. And so this idea of this transition between the physical and the virtual, and I think mixed reality is this uh, kind of pure uh, uh, movement between the two. And so true mixed reality is where I'm able to be here with you now in a physical sense, uh, have the augmented world enter into my experience and eventually become kind of absorbed with the virtual altogether and replace this environment and we'll be able to seamlessly transition back and forth between all of these. And this is going to change the way we live as humans entirely. Oops. So as an example of uh, some mixed reality from the HoloLens, you'll see young Conker here running around a landscape. Uh, the beautiful thing here is that this game is redesigning itself depending on your environment. And, and this, uh, this character under, understands this environment. It understands that's a table. Uh, it understands this is the floor and there's a wall and it can climb up the wall and, and run around on the floor and engage with virtual elements, but also engage with these physical elements. So there's a lot of challenges in working with this from a design standpoint because you're no longer designing a game for a fixed environment like you normally would, uh, you're designing a game that needs to alter itself every single time it's played. So before I go too far into the technology, I'll just talk a little bit about my journey into mixed reality. So I was a uh, architect and an installation artist. And most of my installation art was based around these architectural abstractions. So I was going into galleries and taking over the gallery entirely, rebuilding rooms within the gallery, uh, creating these new spaces or new environments. And in one piece, I created a single channel of sound. And I was just blown away by how the sound changed the entire environment. So I started playing with sound more and more, introducing more channels of sound, um, 16 channels, and eventually up to 132 channels of sound in order to create a, a very immersive experience in which sound was a volumetric medium, a, a, a kind of tangible physical medium rather than um, more ephemeral. And through that process, I needed to learn electronics because there was no sound system at that time that could handle 132 channels. Quickly thereafter, I found programming was faster than soldering, so I started programming. And after that, I found game engines and found that that opened up a whole new world of possibilities. So I was working with VR, and in uh, grad school, school, this was mostly in caves, a uh, wildly impractical uh, application of, of VR, but there was nothing else at the time. Uh, it was incredibly empowering and exciting, but not something that you could ever distribute to other people. So it was sort of masturbatory to work with. And graphics at that time were not very powerful, uh, computer graphics. And so it, it always felt very just detached from, from your reality. So I, I stepped back and started taking a different approach to it. I, tried to use the brain for visual processing, and I induced people into hypnotic trances and projected auditory and physical stimuluses onto them in order to recompose their own memories to create new experiences. I could play the sound of a uh, playground and the sound of a car driving by, and you would recompose those two experiences that you've had before and create this new environment in which there's a road next to a, a, a playground. And these kind of storylines could become much more elaborate than that and could uh, pull upon your own experiences, your personal experiences, but could also pull upon uh, experiences that you've, you've seen through film or, or video. And so now you could uh, visit the Taj Mahal in a way, but through your own imagination as opposed to uh, through the film. During that time, technology and, and computer graphics advanced dramatically. So. I love this, this picture, and this is even three years old now, so you can imagine how far that's progressed till today. 
So I, I dive back into working with, with the virtual directly. And with game engines, I was able to play within uh, these virtual worlds, and I, I could really become God and, and uh, create brand new environments and break the laws of physics. And for me, working on the screen was incredibly immersive. I could put myself in that space. Uh, and other people, it wasn't. Because for them, this archetype of the game engine was one in which they needed to have goals and accomplishments. And I'm not a person that thinks in narrative necessarily. I, th I think in experience and I think in setting up the, the possibility for narrative, but that you are actually creating that narrative yourself as you're experiencing it. And I'm more concerned with uh, the, the more intangible emotions that this experience can, can bring you. So this piece sort of failed, uh, but it was, an interesting, uh, it was an interesting journey. And right when I was kind of releasing it and sharing it with people, VR came out. We were one of the first people to, to back the Kickstarter. Uh, I'd been following Oculus, or what was to become Oculus for a long time at that point, and was completely in love and obsessed with getting my hands on, on VR, now that it was in a form that was actually realistic and, and in a way that, that you could share with others and didn't require a 12 foot by 12 foot space and eight projectors and a massive computer. One of my, uh, so this, this piece evolved into what you're seeing here, which was a lucid dream-like journey through a number of different environments in a very Mary Kami-like way. You would transition through these, these different environments. So you would, you'd feel, as you were going through it, everything felt natural and as if it made sense that you're transitioning from space to this planet to underwater to running with elephants. Uh, all these things made sense until you stepped away from this experience and realized just how kind of outlandish it was. And you don't know how you, you got there. So it's in this very dreamlike transitional sense. Um, some of the, the challenge technically here was doing, transitioning a person through all these environments without ever needing to load a screen. And it was very important that there was never this, this break in the experience. So we continue to work with uh, VR at Future Colossal. We're doing a lot of practical applications. Uh, what you're seeing here is a, a sports training device for professional athletes, uh, a, a way to kind of uh, practice uh, your, your batting and analyze your batting. So this becomes a, a real practical application. But then there's all kinds of other applications for VR we're working in. Uh, one of the, the the more interesting challenges that I think we've taken on was trying to create a, a social VR in which we could have multiple people on the, um, in a VR environment working together to solve something simultaneously and doing so on a mobile platform without real solid tracking. So uh, you know, how, do you, how do you create this experience in which you actually feel like you're there with another person when the only input we get is your head movement? And so we're using a lot of IK in order to animate these avatars' body and kind of bring your, your minimal gesture to life in, in a way that other people can understand your emotions and your, your gestures. So that brings me to AR, which kind of parallels a lot of the story I just told you. Uh, at Future Colossal, we've been focusing on AR for a long time. Uh, a lot of AR kind of traditionally was seen uh, as this uh, on-device AR, or the mobile AR. We've certainly done that. But our focus was much more on creating uh, large-scale, high-production value AR. Uh, this is an experience that uh, I did about uh, 10 or 11 years ago in which um, a street in New York, you would walk up to it and this tornado would start blowing down the street behind you, pick up stop signs and eventually crash through the window and crack the window in front of you. And it was this very simple 20-second uh, experience, but it was also this very magic experience because you're not expecting that when you, when you happen upon it. Uh, and there was something really 
nice about how simple and short the experience was. It would just loop through that. And along the way, it would snap a photo of you at some point that you could then text in and share with yourself. Uh, but we didn't tell you when you were going to snap this photo. And, and it, it, that kind of empowered the, the user to use their imagination a little bit more. And so people would hang out for long periods of time. And, and the photos, as we scrubbed through them to, to see, kind of study how people engaged with this, were really exciting. And you'd have people holding on to street signs, holding their baby upside down in the air like it's blowing away. And my, my favorite moment was I, we see this cop show up. And uh, he doesn't look terribly impressed. He walks away after just one photo. And he comes back about 15 minutes later with eight other cops. And they spend the next 20 minutes taking photos and swinging around on each other. Um, so it, something like this is, is unexpected. It's on the street. Uh, you know, it's, it has to grab someone's attention instantly and then give them an opportunity to engage with it and kind of give back to it in some way in order for it to be uh, a successful uh, project. Uh, other projects that we've done that would be in the kind of AR and, and mixed reality realm are uh, for BMW, we took all the cars on 6th Avenue and digitally removed them and replaced them with BMWs. And so in real time, uh, you would see these, these cars drive by. You would see the reflections on the side of the car as uh, the reflection of the building passing by. And um, it was nighttime. Uh, and we detected that cars' headlights were on, these cars' headlights were on. If it was raining, water would be dripping down the side of the cars. It was a very elaborate and, and probably one of the hardest tracking solutions we've ever, ever done. Uh, at that time, really the best tracking we could do was just through, a, through standard cameras and, and computer vision. Uh, to a piece that we just recently completed for Oppenheimer down in the Wall Street area, uh, in which half of the piece was this. Uh, we, we took over the whole, whole scene and transported you into uh, 1957 Wall Street, and so primarily men in suits. And, uh, and you became this kind of avatar. Uh, and the other side of things, for a different fund of theirs, we uh, brought all these animals from different parts of the world and had them inhabit the, the screen, and, and people just flocked to it. It was really interesting because when I was originally starting uh, in these street-based advertisements, we could really just stick up a camera in the screen and people would just look at a big image of themselves and that was enough for them. And that quickly disappeared. But now, all of a sudden, it's kind of back again. I, I think it's, it's selfies and Snapchat. Now it's, it's people are still obsessed with themselves and, and this is another outlet for it. So it's, it's funny how, how that disappeared and, and now is viable again. But all these led to uh, mixed reality for me. It was something that I hadn't expected. I, I was obsessed with VR my whole life. Uh, and then MR came around and the HoloLens came around. We got our hands on this. And the first time I, I put this on, I was playing Robo Raid where you're you're attacking robots that are blowing out of your, the walls of, of your house or wherever you're using this. And uh, I'm running around my, my whole, whole house. I'm, there's monsters coming out in my, my kitchen, and I'm shooting them. And another one comes out in my bedroom. So I run all the way through my living room into my bedroom. Uh, I'm standing on one side. And I'm surrounded by monsters. And I realize I've got nothing I can do. I'm going to die. And then I, I find out I can barrel roll over my bed. So I barrel roll over my bed, and I shoot him, and I win the level. And I was giggling, and I never giggled in VR. And this is just, it was incredible. I realized that that kind of freedom to move around without wires and, and to uh, interject the, the virtual into the physical was so much more magic and in, almost empowering as a user than it was to just erase the physical world altogether. Uh, so we've done a number of, of uh, commercial-based mixed reality experiences. Here's a small one that we did for um, MasterCard at the Miami Open. Right now, we're kind of introducing this to brands, and, and they're, they're a little nervous around it. Uh, and so these all end up being very kind of low-budget, small projects, uh, just a couple weeks or so to, to create them. But they're good experiments, and they're, they're good ways for us to... Um, watch how people will engage with them. And, and so now we're uh, kicking off a new project in which we're, we're working on an experience that will take place in a, in a space probably about uh, eight times the size of this entire auditorium 
uh, where we can have 50 HoloLens with people wearing them simultaneously, engaging with each other, engaging with the virtual environment, engaging with the physical environment. And that'll be, um, I mean, there's a ton of challenges there. And, and the HoloLens really isn't designed for that. So we're, we're actually augmenting the HoloLens to some, some degree in order to make it do what we want it to do. But that's going to be incredibly exciting. So where's mixed reality now? Uh, as you heard about earlier, there's a number of key technologies that, that make this happen. Uh, spatial mapping, so the idea that this device understands the space. Primarily, that's around time of flight uh, tracking, depth tracking. So it's firing out IR, bouncing off that environment, timing how long it takes for that light to bounce back into itself. And through that, we start to understand that this is a floor, and that's a wall, and this is a table. Um, Positional, rotational sensing, that ties in with the spatial tracking, because if I turn, it knows that my environment turned, but also through internal sensors. Holographic overlay, there's a number of approaches to doing this. Microsoft, uh, just a couple of days ago, announced uh, through their research wing that there's a new holographic display that they're working on using um, lasers and, and photons that fire uh, kind of in front of your eye in a, in a much different way than what uh, the, the HoloLens does now, which is essentially a Pepper's ghost, so a technology from the uh, 1900s in which we've, you've got a, a plane of glass that's reflecting an image upon you. Uh, part of, part of the, the challenge with the holographic overlay is that you're dealing with something that is additive only, so uh, it's just brights. You can't create a black. You can't block out vision, so you can only, uh, you can take your your character and you can have him run or her run behind an object and disappear itself, but you can't make that object disappear unless it's behind a field of white. So that becomes a really challenging uh, design uh, challenge that you need to solve. And then of course the game engine. Uh, now there's other ways to, to work with HoloLens or with uh, mixed reality besides a game engine, if you're working with something more abstract. But the game engine has all the tools you need to understand uh, the virtual space so that you can mix that with the, the physical space. Uh, and so all of these you're going to see combined right here, except for uh, positional, rotational. You're seeing uh, the scan ahead that, that showed how it understood this environment. You're seeing these virtual objects additively, so you're seeing no blacks interjected here, but you're seeing them interact with that environment. Uh, everything you're seeing here is rendered directly out of a mixed reality device, the R9. Uh, you're seeing these reflections that seem, make these objects feel like they're very real in that environment. So that's the real magic behind mixed reality. So there's a ton of mixed reality devices right now, and more are, are being developed. Uh, the main one, the one that we use, is HoloLens, and uh, I would say that's still the superior device. But there's a lot of other options. Uh, the ODG R9 has some really impressive optics and uh, sensing capabilities and looks way cooler than a HoloLens on your head. The Daiquiri is really designed for industrial. And so there's some really powerful things about this, some really uh, incredible sensors in here. It, it uses LiDAR, which shoots out lasers instead of just a, a flash of light. And so it's able to work outside in which the, the HoloLens cannot. And so for industrial uses, if you're working on a, a large gas plant and uh, navigating the whole facility to try to find a particular pipe that's got a leak, this is something that you can use. It's like the super uh, construction helmet. The Meta 2 is a really interesting device that uh, was probably, I would say, the closest competition to the HoloLens at this point. Um, and it's more advanced in some ways, less advanced than others. It does give you really great hand tracking abilities much more like the leap motion. So uh, you can occlude things with your hands and you can, to some degree, and you can, uh, it recognizes just more standard gestures. If I want to reach out and grab something and pinch it, I can actually grab it and pinch it and pull it and interact with something more like it's a, a physical object rather than uh, having to train myself in a new gesture like the connect and uh, translate Kind of between these 2D interfaces that we're used to and the, the physical world that we're in. And then there's a number of uh, inside out VR devices or MR devices, like the Bridge, like the Zapbox, uh, the Acer, and the HP that were mentioned earlier. And these are devices in which you're not looking at the, the real world, you're looking at 
a uh, camera's vision of that real world and then that can be augmented. So an advantage there is that now we can occlude things uh, with, with the virtual and now we can add blacks. But the disadvantage is that you're isolated again. You're no longer looking at the real world around you. You're looking at this translation of the real world around you and how that becomes augmented. So what are the limitations of, of where uh, mixed reality is now? Field of view, I would say, is by far the biggest. With the HoloLens, you're looking at a field of view that's only about this big. Now, that becomes a design challenge. If you design appropriately, then maybe this isn't as big of a deal. And, and after you've been in MR for five, 10 minutes, you kind of forget about this. Because unlike uh, VR, where your view is, is completely controlled by the device, even though my field of view is this, I still have all of my normal field of view, my, all of my peripheral. So it's not as distracting as having a small field of view in VR is. Sunlight. With sunlight's the devil to most tracking technologies. Uh, in this case, time of flight doesn't work. And so uh, we're it's shooting out IR blast to try to bounce off objects to determine depth. But the sun shoots out even more IR, and it can't compete. So it sees nothing. Uh, there are other, other forms of tracking that it implements and that can be implemented, but that's a major form and a major limitation because you don't only want to use these devices, especially being untethered on the indoors. And then mobile hardware, and this is advancing incredibly fast, but battery life and the heat from battery, processing the heat from processing, this is something you're wearing on your head. Uh, you want it to, to be light and fast and cool. And of course, fashion because that's gonna be probably one of the biggest limitations for consumers. People don't wanna walk around looking like this. Uh, it was one of the things that killed Google Glass, um, glass holes. So the advantages, no isolation. I can be in mixed reality and I can look at someone else in the eyes and have a conversation while my world is still being augmented around me. Uh, whether or not they're in the same kind of augmented world as I am. Uh, if they are, they can share that same, same view with me. If they're not, then I can just add to what I'm experiencing. Uh, unobstructed sight and hearing. So this is the same thing, being able to see uh, another person in, in kind of real life instead of translated through VR. And then the HoloLens, the speakers on this are really amazing. It's this augmented sound. So. For me, if I'm in it, I have this whole other uh, soundscape that can be projected into my ears and the people around me can't hear it. But at the same time, I don't have anything obscuring my hearing. And so I can have a conversation with you and, and still be in this augmented audio scape as well. And then of course, being able to safely navigate your environment. You can see the world and so you don't do this. Uh, and there's all kinds of practical applications for mixed reality. I think it's in the long run, this is the, the much more um, kind of enterprise and, and consumer ready device. It's one in which you can use in your everyday uh, kind of work or, or personal life. In this case, you're walking around a factory and uh, I believe this is the daiquiri. You're walking around the factory and being able to uh, track uh, thermodynamics in, in real time and, and guide yourself in ways that you don't you don't need to be as well trained and so for a factory for instance this lowers the threshold of uh, education that's required for their uh, their work staff now that could be a horrible thing as well but um, but it's also an exciting thing and then removing dis dis uh, display hardware you know it, this is something that can start to remove all the screens that are constantly surrounding us. Alex Kitman has uh, the kind of uh, coined as the inventor of the HoloLens from Microsoft has a great TED talk all about how we live in this 2D world right now and it's this weird time in humanity in which uh, we've, we've left the 3D world and that this is the start of being able to re-emerge into this 3D realm and, and the, uh, you know, we lose all of the 2D interfaces and, and 2D um, interactions and, and we're now, all of our computational and, and uh, 
virtual and physical and imaginatory combine themselves into this, this new future. And along with that comes uh, telecommuting. So being able to project yourself into another environment and interact with other people that, that aren't there. Uh, and so along this uh, kind of mixed reality continuum, there's this, this fits into the early scale where uh, we're able to augment someone else's environment, but it also works kind of in reverse in which we're able to augment our environment with with uh, the virtual environment and, and stay there as the physical. One of my favorite um, ideas or, or concepts around mixed reality is the idea of the, what I'm calling smart dumb objects. And so at the Build 2015 where they released uh, HoloLens, they had this great demo in which there's this very dumb robot that doesn't really know how to do anything. It knows how to move forward, backwards, and turn, but it doesn't know what this environment is around it, and it doesn't know uh, how to, to navigate in any way. But by using the sensing capabilities of the HoloLens, it's able to empower that, that stupid device to now understand this environment. And when Alex Kipman here stands in the way, the HoloLens is able to inform it to walk around, to navigate around it. And so this starts to become a very exciting idea. The um, Magic Leap talks about it as uh, totems, and so kind of empowering these everyday devices or objects. And this water bottle, while has no real intelligence to it, now can have intelligence to it. We can attach uh, interfaces to it. And, and as I approach this every morning uh, to get a, a new drink of water, it can inform me about the news or, or allow me to turn on my car. And so where's the, the future in mixed reality? Uh, mobile processing and computer vision is going to uh, increase dramatically, and this is going to empower uh, mo uh, mixed reality devices to move away from time of flight and use just standard computer vision and uh, 2D cameras. And so using an RGB camera, you don't have the restrictions that you had previously. And we're seeing right now uh, Google has released or is about to release a new platform that allows all phones to have positional tracking uh, using, I'm sure, computer vision, uh, feature detection, uh, optical flow. And so this is, is really exciting and really empowering for uh, creators. 5G, I think this is going to be huge. So 2020, we're going to have 5G. And now, all of a sudden, uh, communicating between different devices becomes very easy. And you're no longer locked to needing to use Wi-Fi in areas, um, streaming graphics to it, and uh, sharing holograms between multiple people becomes much easier. And along with that becomes cloud-based processing and rendering. and so. That's going to make these devices get smaller, because now they don't have to do as much of the work. These devices can communicate back to a server that does, handles all of the, the, the rendering and then sends that to your device that then can display it for you, allowing for a really small device. Now, of course, latency still becomes a big issue here, and so there needs to be some translation of that um, within the device itself. And volumetric content, uh, which is something that I'm incredibly excited about. We've played around with it a lot at Future Colossal, and there's a number of uh, great companies, including uh, Microsoft, that are working on solutions for this. Uh, the idea here being, uh, if you're not familiar, that with a camera or a video camera, you're capturing an environment in front of you, but you're capturing it as a 2D plane. With volumetric content, you're capturing that entire environment in its whole. And so later on, instead of being fixed to wherever this camera was looking out at you, I'm able to walk around this environment and walk to the back and look at this environment from an infinite amount of perspectives. And along with this comes network spatial mapping. So once we have all of these different devices and we've got um, them sensing the world around them, and we're communicating back to servers, we can start to stitch together all of these. And we've got this, this three-dimensional volumetric map of the entire world that can be used for both uh, superimposing virtual elements into it, uh, but also lots of practical cases, like fire departments being able to understand the floor plan of a building that was built 
a hundred years ago and it's probably been remodeled 50 times and they're trying to save someone on the fifth floor. Uh, now this becomes a practical solution that they can see through the smoke and understand exactly where they are and where their, their other fire department uh, colleagues are. Uh, one thing that's not on here is pupil tracking. So being able to look at where uh, your pupil is and, and do foveated rendering. So, and so you're able to render high, higher quality images right where you're looking and downgraded image around uh, where you're not looking. And so this becomes, uh, kind of allows for much better rendered environments with much less processing, but also allows uh, for designers to start to play with the idea of focus. So right now in mixed reality, everything is in focus, but as soon as we're tracking your eyes and where you're focusing, objects in MR can become in or out of focus. And then the future uh, eventually is removing the device itself uh, contact lenses. Currently there is a contact lens that has four pixels, which is a long ways off from the roughly 32K that we see. But the idea is it's there. And uh, all of these things that I've mentioned are already here today. They're just in their infancy. And so in the future, they're all going to come together and we're going to live in one world in which uh, the virtual and the physical are somewhat in har harmony and, and we can create the world we want to live in around us, whether that's for a good thing or a bad thing. And that's it.